Uh, I'm Aditi Suri, I'm faculty at IHS, and joining me is, is Gautam Bhan, who's also faculty here at IHS. Uh, this evening, we're going to talk about two very specific uh, segments of the fellowship, which is projects, and then the end of the fellowship, which is internships. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce myself and take you through what projects are and what they mean for the program, and then we can take some of your questions. Um, like I was saying, I'm Aditi. I'm a sociologist here, and I'm faculty, and I do a lot of work around the future of work. I also will be anchoring what we call projects, which um, if you've looked at the Urban Fellows um, uh, of how the course is set up, it comes during the second elective term of the fellowship. Um, and what projects does it is it allows um, fellows at the UFP to work on live IHS projects. Uh, so fellows uh, get to work with different kinds of professionals at the institution. They work with architects, planners, uh, people working on forest systems, on economies, um, and you get to see what it means to work on a real life live project and understand what the modalities of working with um, clients in this sector are. Uh, we've had projects running at the fellowship for about two years and fellows have worked on a wide range of subjects. Uh, this year we had students, um, we had designers and engineers working on projects around the future of work. We had students interested in sustainability studies looking at how to evaluate um, forest ecosystems and what value means to them. We had, uh, we've had many students over the last two years work deeply on uh, furthering our rental housing work um, and different models around that. Um, and what the projects that I just do is they give you about four months to really embed within the project and the project team. You get about two days a week to work specifically on project work. And that time is for you and for your team to really understand how to move through a subject. Um, and you get time to be in the field. You get um, IHS and, and, and projects with support you in traveling for the project if that's required and give you really good understanding of how to look at the field from different perspectives and different kind of project types that we have going on at the institution. Um, I'm going to let Gautam speak about internships and then maybe after that we can take some of your questions. So as Aditi was saying, um, I, I just also introduced myself. I'm Gautam Pan. I'm one of the faculty uh, at IHS as well. And my work is centered around questions of uh, urban housing, uh, social protection, as well as on identity and social practice in the urban. So as Aditi was saying, in the elective term, you have two days a week that is dedicated to your project time, right? And you're, you're part of an IHS team, it's ongoing. And then this leads you right through to the end of the elective term in February. And when you're done with that, you essentially transition out of the full-time taught uh, component of the program. So your classroom teaching ends, and then the final phase of the Urban Fellows program begins, which is the internship. So the internship is a two-month full-time placement um, at a, uh, a two-month full-time placement at an organization outside IHS. Um, it is basically a project that is created partly in consonance and supervision with your faculty, but almost entirely in a relationship directly with the organization you work with. So this becomes quite important for us because in a way it's a simulation in terms of transitioning back from the fellowship into full-time work. Um, over the years, about 20% of fellows tend to remain and get absorbed and work full-time in the organization they did their internship in. So very often the internship is also a placement mechanism that's not guaranteed or part of the design. It happens sometimes and it doesn't happen at other times. Um, the internship is guaranteed, by which we mean that IHS has a list in the last, um, in the last fellowship, this was a list of 75 organizations um, for 34 fellows um, that are interested and committed to taking um, UFP fellows as interns for the two months that so they've been doing it before, they do it again. <clears throat> and fellows basically apply to up to five of these places in rank order of preference, um, and they're interviewed by the organizations, and the organizations then choose and make internship offers. Um, some of these are paid internships, some of these are not, but those that are not, uh, IHS gives financial stipend support because we don't want your ability to take a particular internship to be influenced by um, the stipend. 
we also don't want, um, if we do not have that support, basically, there would be a bias to internships in formal organizations as opposed to, say, social movements or community groups who don't pay stipends. And so we, we take the responsibility, both of you finding, um, both of you finding the, um, uh, being able to find the internship uh, as well as being able to sustain yourself through it. Um, in, if I look at some of the data that I have in front of me for this, is that what are the kinds of in, um, what are the kinds of places that we have had folks take their internships in? I'll just give you the data in the for the last year. So out of thirty five fellows, twenty percent went to think tanks. Um, so, for example, the Center for Policy Research, um, ORF, the Center for Study of Migration, and the uh, French Institute in Pondicherry. 11% went to the private sector. So we've had folks intern at CBRE, Richard Ellis. We've had folks intern at BCG, at um, other private sector consultancy firms. 25% went to education and research places. 3% to media. Um, we have fellows interning right now at India Spend. We've had fellows intern at the Mint, for example. 6% in government. So fellows interning in housing boards, in rural housing corporations. We even had fellows intern at the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy, uh, uh, the National Academy of Administration, <clears throat> where the IAS are trained in Basuri. 14% um, work for nonprofits and 10 years. So there really is a wide range in the internship period of places where people go. And this kind of reflects diverse student trajectories depending on the kind of post fellowship pathways that they want. So the internship is one of the first bridges you have in exiting the taught fellowship component back into the real world of practice. Several fellows also, you can petition to not take an internship with an organization, but to intern with IHS itself uh, on one of our project teams. These are a limited number of places because we do encourage people to go out. Um, but they are, for some cases, we do allow through a petition and competitive evaluation people to work on IHS projects. Um, and the final thing I would say is that every year, one or two fellows petition the academic committee in order to do an independent project during the internship period. Now, this is something that you really have to convince us is of value to be able to do, but it is a possibility that we can do. So taken together, the project and the internship are basically two places of applied experiential learning um, that happen in the second half of the Urban Fellows Program. They're places where you get your hands dirty. They're places where you directly apply in complex real world situations. They're places that, unlike the practica or the classroom, are not curated for you, um, both in terms of the project as well as the internship. These are real life practice situations. Um, and so there are clients, there are deadlines, there are constraints, and there are teams. You have reporting lines. One of the things that we often say is that you know your faculty in the classroom is your boss in the project, and they're two very different relationships to have with the same person. It can be confusing sometimes for everyone involved, but largely we survive unscathed. Um, but it really has, for many fellows, been um, both of these spaces have been very valuable experiences of the fellowship because they get you to test and apply still within the program what you've learned, and they also let you do pieces of individual substantive work get to produce outputs that you can talk about as your own. Um, so that's the broad description. Um, on the website, you can see a list of both internship organizations as well as projects, uh, examples of which Aditi gave. Um, so let us, um, I think Aditi, if you want to add anything more to what you said, otherwise we'll begin to open it up. Um, just to add to say that, you know, both projects and LFTs really give you time to think about what you've learned in the class and think about how you're planning your next career moves. So within the program, they give you this uh, little time and resources to think about what kind of career you want, what kind of where you want to go work and what kind and how your these professional skills can start to play into this new sector of work you're learning. So it's a really good experimentation. Um, maybe we can start to take some questions now. Yes, the floor is open and we're happy to discuss the projects and internships in specific. Um, but again, if you have questions about any other part of the fellowship, uh, at some point, feel free to throw them in and we'll take them in turn. You can also ask us, if you don't have a specific question, to talk more about any aspect of either the internships or the projects just in general, and we can continue a little bit from there. So there's a question. Um, um, 
Sahiti, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, can you tell us the nature of work people have in their internships? Uh, yeah, I can pick this one up. Um, so the nature of work uh, really varies. Um, it depends on the organization that you go to. So one of the things that we ask fellows when they start thinking about which organizations they apply to, actually one of the things your faculty mentor asks you is what is the kind of experience you want? Do you want to an internship that gives you a lot of time on the field? Do you want an internship that allows you to write? Do you want an internship that exposes you to a new sector? Do you want an internship in a big, big institution, a small place, more applied, more reflective? Is it a question of environment or city? So in a way, the nature of work that you do will be determined by the kind of place that you apply to. Right? So if you apply to one of the think tanks like Hyderabad Urban Labs or the Center for Policy Research, or you work at, uh, then you are choosing to work in an urban research think tank where you want to be involved and see what it's like to work in a place that does projects on urban research and urban questions. So I think that so you know you'll have a more then there your everyday life in the internship is simulating what research life is like to be part of teams picking up questions you'll do lots of field work etc. But if you take an internship for example in a journalism space then your everyday life is the writing and production of stories. So. It really depends on what kind of experience and practice you want to use. So fellows make the internship decision in two ways. Some of them use it to begin to experience the kind of work they think they want to do post the fellowship. So it's like a testing ground for two months. And some are very certain what they want to do after the fellowship. So they want to do something completely new. Right? So they'll join a you know a very strong field-based grassroots mobilization for advocacy movement uh, in, in like NAPF or the National Co Com Commission for Dalit Human Rights right, after those have interned in the past because they just want to experience that and they know they're not going to get a chance to experience it again. So an internship can both be very career centric, setting up your CV, it can be completely transversal and giving you a new experience. It can also allow you to, so one of our fellows, for example, went to intern with a big private consultancy because he said, I'll never do this in my life. I want to see what it's like be inside one of the big private firms. Fair enough, so that's the way you go. So there's a large amount of variation, but you get a sense of what it is because all the internship organizations interview you before you go, but they give you a sense of what they expect. So when you, when you accept their offer, if you choose to go to them, then you have an idea already of what the project would be like and what the work would be like. So what we talk, say to the organization is we don't want you to um, we don't want you to just go to an organization and just be there every day, just as part of the organization. You go with a specific project, so that project is discussed in the interview before you go. So you have a specific piece of work to finish and complete in your two-month internship. And we found that that gives a lot of direction to the work. So you're not going there just figuring it out. You're going there to do something specific. So, so I'm going to read... Uh... Follow up, just give me a second. Yeah. Uh, so, this is a general question. In um, what percentage of you have been involved in the use of technology skills like data analysis? Uh, we have another question from Sneha. I'll just read these two questions and then we can go and answer them. Kind of in terms of our experience in the past, most involved getting oriented to the work the organization does, and I feel like one or two months usually doesn't allow you to go into a the deeper parts of the issue. So then how is the internship project here at IHS different from internships designed in other places? You want to take the first and then I can take the second. Sure. So Saiti, you had another question on the use of technology and skills like data analysis. Um, uh, during the fellowship, you have the option um, to learn a number of skills. And use a number of technologies if that's how you want to uh, carve your career in the future. We have something called um, skill labs during during the fellowship. Some of which are some of which you choose to focus on, uh, and some of which are part of the program that you have to do. You do learn things like uh, GIS and data analysis and all data visualization skills. You have the option of taking advanced courses in those as well, um, and you also have the opportunity to learn. Um, using different media to uh, understand um, a lot of skills like uh, media itself, filmmaking, photography, using sound, using radio and podcasting to communicate uh, research outputs. 
So there is a wide range of technologies you can pick up um, at the fellowship. But then you want to. Yeah. Answer. So that's why I, I appreciate that point uh, really well, Sneha. This, so internships are really tricky thing, right? and I think the point that I was trying to make about not letting you just join an internship without a specific purpose is an important one. Um, I think the distinction between internships else normally doing internships and internships at IHS, I think the one distinction is that the project that is defined for your two months is defined between the organization, the fellow, and the faculty mentor. And I think the definition of that project allows a certain check in picking something that can be done quite reasonably and quite well. What it also means is that when the fellow goes to one of the organizations as an intern in the IHS program, they only work on the project that was decided they came in. They don't get involved in the general functioning of the organization. So there is a focus um, in their work. There's always a risk about two months being too short. And so sometimes what happens is that fellows work with the organization to extend their internship to three. Sometimes they've extended it to six um, in order to complete them. In most cases, we have found that if you specify the project in advance, if there's an agreement between the institution, the mentor, and the fellow, then two months is enough time to produce something quite substantive. Um, and you always have that possibility of extending it just a little bit in case you want to. So I would say there are, we have about four or five fellows every year who extend their internships in order to complete an output they're satisfied with. But most actually are good at the end of two months. Um, so I would say that's the distinction because these are not you're you're not applying as an intern through a normal internship process. You're basically entering a process that has already been brokered between IHS and the organization. So all of these organizations, you know, are happy to take folks. They take folks on our recommendation. They don't put you through the normal internship process. And so there's a difference in the way they treat you, and they treat you as basically someone who's come into a specific piece of work. Uh, and I think that we have found that that shapes the internship experience quite significantly. We have another question from Kartik, uh, who, say, who says he lives in Malaysia, um, and he wants to know if, uh, even though the U.S. is a full-time residential program, he can live at home and do the program. Uh, in Malaysia? Malaysia and Malaysia, which is like... Oh, Malaysia. <laughs> Sorry, I heard I heard Malaysia, not Malaysia. And I was like, I really don't think you can do it in Malaysia. Um, yes, I can take this one. So, look, it is possible, um, but I will say very strongly that one of the strongest learning spaces that you have in the UFP is the shared living space with your fellows. It's where a large amount of learning happens. The shared living space is absolutely free, so it doesn't come at a cost to you. And uh, I mean, while it doesn't, we don't preclude people from living at home, we do highly, 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 highly encourage your taking what is free accommodation and really good, good accommodation, I can tell you. Um, because I think that what we have consistently seen in the feedback is that that experience of living together has been key for the fellows is one of the things that enables um, not just collegiality in a good time, which happens, but in, enables that kind of interdisciplinary peer-to-peer -peer learning that is structured into the fellowship program. We have a lot, last year's batch of 35 people had 26 degrees among them. So the greatest amount of learning you will do on interdisciplinarity will be from each other, it will not be from the faculty. And I think that living in a shared space, it really centers you in that way. So, you know, you can pop back and forth from between, uh, between Sadashiv Nagar and Maleshwaram, um, but I would I would keep a bed uh, in I would keep a bed on the campus. Is there another question from Harshita who has a specific question about whether there have been fellows involved in real time open design projects during their internship tenure? Um, I am trying to think. I know that fellows ended up working in real design projects. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the best examples I know are one of IHS's live projects is that we are our design lab is um, is, uh, is has been has been uh, commissioned by the government of Uttar Pradesh to redesign the outpatient departments of 12 district hospitals across UP. 
and um, that includes both assessment simulations and design itself. Um, and so they were involved in that project. Two of our fellows worked on that project. Um, the second place I would say in design, um, we've had folks that are work we're working with domestic worker unions in Jaipur, and that's more of a product design, not urban design, but still design, design lab isn't thinking about ways to make uh, baby carriers that allow uh, domestic workers to keep their children close to them so they can breastfeed them even if they continue to work. Uh, and I know one of our fellows worked with the design cell at um, SPA on uh, live urban design projects during their internship, but then stayed on as a consultant to work with them full time afterwards. Um, so yeah. And again, one of the things about the internship that I think you guys should realize is every year the number and diversity of the internships change because um, the fellows' diversity changes. So, you know, last year we had art historians, so then we had four cultural art archivists that joined the internship, like the Aga Khan Center, which that the fellows at now, or the Eka Cultural Resources Archive, you know, and so basically every year when new disciplines come in, the fellows help us expand the contacts and networks. We went from 30 organizations to 45 organizations to 75 organizations. So if you come in and you have urban design, then very early we'll start expanding places that fit. So, you're not bound only to the internship list that we have. It, it's a mobile and um, So Divya has a question on what the selection process is. Uh, and Divya, I'm assuming you mean for the projects and for internships. So I'll just take you through that. Uh, so very similar to what Gautam was saying about internships, the list of projects available to you to work on as a fellow changes every year depending on the kind of work that IHS is doing on different research projects and practice projects that are taking place in the organization. Um, and those live projects uh, will, will, um, will propose a set of projects uh, every year and you will decide uh, in, in, in a somewhat competitive process with your with advice from your mentor which project suits your background and your interest the most. Similarly, as Gantar mentioned, for the internship, you decide uh, with your, with your in, in consultation with your mentor to see what kind of a project you want to work on in your internship. So, um, I'm going to let Gautam answer this question, which is what does a high potential fellow candidate's application look like at the Urban Fellows Program? Sorry, say again, what does a? What does, what does a good application look like um, at the US, a high potential fellow? <laughs> So one of the things I would say is you're much better off using the word good than high potential. So it's the, and, and that's one of the key things I want to say about what a good application looks like. So two, three things. One is we are not looking to be impressed by the world's most sophisticated and glorious series. Um, we, we, what we want to see, we're happy to see the work you've done. We're happy to see your accomplishments. We want to hear about them. But fundamentally what we want is that we want to sense in you three things. One is we want to send genuine curiosity and passion about the urban. We don't want to, we don't want your application to read like you also applied here or that you just thought of the urban and said, why not, right? What we want to hear is that the urban is something you think about. It's something you're passionate about. It's something you want to engage with. You may not have ever engaged with it before. So curiosity and passion don't require evidence already of excellence and engagement. That's not what we're looking for. Right? We're looking for a sense of saying, look, sit, I think about cities all the time. I think about these issues all the time. I think about them. I'm interested in them. I want to be part of them. That's the number one thing we want to see in applications. We, we want to see curiosity. We want to see passion. We want to see excitement. The second thing we want to see is that you have taken seriously the fellowship in itself. You understood its form. You spent time understanding its elements. You understand what it is and you understand what it's not. So you actually are able to communicate to us that this fellowship fits you at this time. And that word is really important, the word fit. You know, a, a fit doesn't mean that you are, that you have to be the best in some kind of threshold of marks or the college you went to. And honestly, we don't care about any of those things. We care about the fact that you are at a time in your life where you want something that the fellowship can give you. So you have a reason. So that, that very boring question on the application of why do you want to be an urban fellow is actually one of the most important questions on it. Because what we don't want is to admit people who then are frustrated and say, but actually I thought I, I would get this and I'm not getting that. So we want you to have clarity on why you're coming. 
why do you want to do this fellowship? Why this fellowship? What about the curriculum structure works for you? What about the institution works for you? Where does it fit into your life? What do you want to do after it? What, what do you want to try and figure out within it what to do after it, right? So, and the last thing I would say is write your applications like yourselves. Don't, I think it's very easy for us to read an application that sounds like someone advised you to write in some very formal, proper, um, I, forgive me for making a little joke at your expense, high potential kind of way. That don't, don't try to write in a way that makes you sound impressive. Write in a way that's honest. Um, don't worry about your language. Don't worry about your grammar. Don't worry about your English. Don't care. Just communicate clearly and simply. But if you write the way you talk, and you show us both that you understand this program and you're a good fit and that you have a curiosity and passion to learn. That's what we want to see. Right? And I, I'm going to say one more thing about the fit. If this fellowship gives a lot of things to people in terms of introducing them to the urban, diversifying their interests, pushing them towards interdisciplinarity. Not everyone wants that. So if we sense that you are someone who knows exactly what you want and you want to work in transport planning, we're going to say, why are you coming to us for an interdisciplinary program instead of doing a program in transportation planning? So think about the core values of the, inter of the, of the UFP, interdisciplinarity, practice, urban fellowship, and then tell us how you fit each of those. So that's what a really good application looks like. It's curious, it's passionate, it takes seriously and tells us why you're a good fit for the program. It helps us see what you'll do when you're here. And it sounds genuine and honest instead of trying to sound very impressive um, in a way that we can, honestly, you read hundreds of these, you can tell when someone's trying to write an application voice and you can tell when someone's trying to write like a, just the person they are. So be the person you are and give it your best shot. And remember, we're not assessing some random threshold of excellence. We're assessing a good fit. We want to take people who will benefit the most from what we have to offer. And we, we can't offer everything to everybody. And it's good to know what the fellowship is not. Um, and we want that sense. Yeah. Actually, uh, answers Karthik's question also, who asked what is the interview process for the perspective of applicants? So Karthik, if you are um, shortlisted into the fellowship, you do have to go through an uh, interview process. And if you just listen back to the things Gautam said, we, we assess very similar things as we do the application. Get a sense of what your interests are, what your interest in the urban is, why you want to work in this area, what you think you can do with this, um, with the fellowship of your future career, uh, and how you think you fit into the kind of uh, subject matter we, we look at. What else? What else? You must have things swirling in your mind. So Rishka has a question on whether people, whether fellows can intern in private architecture firms uh, during their internships. Yeah, absolutely. So we've had fellows who've interned with uh, Sanjay Prakash's studio, Shift. Uh, we've had folks who've interned with Mohan Rao in his urban design firm. We've had fellows who've interned with a third architectural firm whose name I can't remember at this point. I'm sorry. I have yeah. it somewhere. But yeah, yeah, the, you can... If you are a trained architect and that is a that is a place you want to spend your entire time, there's a very good case for that to be made and the academic committee and your mentor can can discuss those things together and find that kind of partnership that suits your profile. Even if That's you don't right. know what architecture firm things. That's right. So that, 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 that's, that's as Aditi said, we both have architectural firms already in our list, and we're happy to add them. So, but yes, we have architects who come through every year. So folks have uh, typically what we find is the architects who come by the time they get to the internship uh, don't seem to want to go to architectural firms anymore, which may have something to do with the interdisciplinarity witchcraft that we practice on them for seven months. Uh, I had a follow-up question on whether internships are outside Bangalore or in the city. They are all over the country, depending on what the organization is that you're interning with. Um, yeah, Ishan, really yeah. Ishan is asking a question on what are you looking for when you assess the sample of work submitted as part of the application? Um, so I can take this one. So what we're looking for in a sample of work is basically um, a sense 
of some of the ways in which you have produced outputs before. Um, there isn't some specific kind of thing we're checking against, but it gives us a sense of the way you write or draw or conceptualize or shoot or produce videos, depending on your discipline. Um, it gives us a sense of a nature of output that you put together. So it's, I mean, it's something we lead with the rest of it. I would say on a couple of things, just be careful in the sample of work. One is if you're submitting work, which is a joint piece of work, then make sure you give a small note to us on what your contribution was. That really, really helps. Um, two is edit and curate. It's a sample. So if it's a long dissertation, pick a chapter. If it's a portfolio, pick three pieces or images of, of, of work that you're proud of and write a little bit about them. So we want a sense of your sensibility because we're partly also getting a sense of the way you approach things. I'll, I'll give you a simple example. If you get an architectural portfolio, that, that then you get a sense also of the way someone's work shows the kind of answers they're writing. So for us, it's a, it's a kind of layer to the rest of the answers. But it's also a chance for you to show us the kind, the fact that you've been involved in sophisticated work before, and that it gives us an indication of responsibility, of teamwork, of professional competence, of capacity. So it allows us to get a kind of rounded picture of what you're doing. So that, that's what we use it. They have asked the question, what kind of projects do fellows do during the internship time? And they were um, just circling back to what Gautam had said earlier. You, your mentor, you and the internship, uh, the organization you interned with, will work out a specific project that fits your interests and the needs of, of the organization before you go in. So there's no one answer to that. But... Uh, we will make we will work at making sure that there is a specific amount of work uh, and output you have to uh, work on in your in your internship time. So maybe what we can do is we can go through a couple of examples of the places where fellows are interning now, and that will give you a sense of the kind of projects that have been come through. So. One of the fellows is a geographer. He's working for the Center for Migration and Development in Kochi, and he's doing research among uh, migration patterns of uh, construction workers in Kerala. Another fellow is uh, doing the work on land pooling and assessment of land pooling and land aggregation in control, special control area zones for the Center for Policy Research. Um, one of our fellows is interning in a consultancy project with, uh, with BCG, with the Boston Consulting Group, where they're doing consulting advisory on the governance of education in Ranchi. One of our fellows is working for the Tata Trust as part of the Odisha Land Rights Titling Program, where they're placed with district um, district collectors um, for governance and some development in districts of Odisha. One of the fellows is interning. I to think of think, think of other fellows. We can. One of the fellows is interning at Danzo that I think can tell you more about. Um, yes. Because it, I'll, I'll talk to the two fellows that uh, we were close to last year. Um, so, like I said, I work um, around the issue of the future of work and what new technology does to changing work conditions. So, I had a very interesting set of fellows that worked with me last year on this during their project time. One was a, um, a UX designer who designed apps and interfaces for your smartphone. He was very interested to see what his uh, background and skill set could do to make you know this app-based work, Swiggy, Uber, Danzo work um, easier for the people who work on them. Uh, and he is now working at Danzo, which is a, uh, a delivery platform. So there's a very nice movement from his, using his skill set to understanding new um, a new way of looking at how to use his skills. And uh, he's also working on uh, figuring out a longer term relationship with them. And another fellow who was working with me last year, who's an engineer, um, who came from a very pure engineering uh, work background. He's also interested in looking at how his understanding of algorithms and machine learning can, can help um, create better ways of looking at what technology is doing to work. So he's working with an institution right now called Just Jobs. Uh, which is focusing on a lot of these these kind of more conceptual aspects to do with that. So there's a very nice movement between uh, a very very diverse skill sets coming in, understanding what to do with urban and jobs and mm -hmm. the employment market in the city, and translating that into the internships. So I hope that gives you a kind of sense of the range of projects um, and internships that people are doing. And 
we can go on and on. It's, there's a lot of very different kinds. So a lot of it really depends on what kind of training the fellow comes from and which direction they're headed and how much they've shifted in the fellowship. And so it really is they're crafted very individually. They're not generic in terms of has asked a question on what are the other exposure events uh, that take place during the fellowship. You want to take this one? The big the four gatherings? Sure. So, Divya, um, you know, exposure to the city and to real life urban issues is weaved in throughout the entire, the entire program. Um, and at all, kind of, during all weeks in all touch points with your faculty, you will be expected to also understand how to apply the concepts you learn in class with uh, what you see in cities and what you see outside the classroom. Um, there are two or three major exposure events that we take you through. Uh, one is called the exposure visit, which um, fellows are taken with faculty and immerse themselves in a, in a particular city um, for about a week or in, in 10 days. But correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, the faculty and lots of stakeholders within the city will lead you through different uh, issues and solutions that the city is, has, has gone through and maybe what we can take you through some of the specifics on Mumbai and Chennai where the fellows went last year. Yeah, so the exposure basically, you know, you're in Chennai and you're in Mumbai, you've just finished the comments and essentially what it is is to get you to suddenly go to a new city and essentially apply all the lenses we taught you on how to read cities in place. So the idea is for you to shift um, the idea is for you to shift your context and realize that what you've gotten is not just an understanding of Bangalore, but an ability to take a set of lenses and read different cities. And so through the seven days, we basically take you to a set of curated visits. You meet government officers, you see the neighborhoods, you read home, you meet the groups, you create the culture, and you're basically constantly reading the city through the layers we taught you in the comments. So we take you to the ecology, the infrastructure, the economy, the planning, the governance, and identity. Uh, the six layers of the, of the commons, basically, and you run all the way through. And so the exposure trip is a way in which to quickly sort of take a set of lenses and realize that how you engage and understand city um, has shifted in the time of the commons. And so, as Adati was saying, exposure outside the classroom is pretty much constant. So you have between the practica and the commons, the exposure trips, and then the, there are four, you know, I can pick up from here, there are four anchoring public events during your time at IHS. We do a, um, uh, an urban film festival, a three-day urban film festival called Urban Men. We do a three-day urban writing festival called City Scripts. We run a two-day policy convening of the Urban Policy Dialogues. And we run something called Research Week or Urban Art, which is our academic research one. So during your time at the fellowship, in addition to the regular public lecture series and film screening, you have these four very strong external all city national convenings that happen that give you a real chance in, in different ways to meet very different kinds of public. So the film festival and the writing festival obviously are one kind, but the policy dialogues and the research conference are unique to IHS. And I think it's a chance in which you get to meet a lot of the policy urban policy makers of the country. Um, as well as to meet academics from all around the world that come in to IHS. Okay, Rahul has a question. Um, how can we incorporate international development cooperation studies into the urban development context? Do you think the urban development lags behind the bigger picture of development in that regard, where more emphasis is given to rural development? How does IHS incorporate urban into the international development context? Um, so I would say there's, you know, uh, it's, this is a this is a full class level question. So I'm not going to answer all of it. Uh, for this, we'll have to apply, get in, and come into the classroom, and then we'll tell you. But I'll, I will answer our positioning. So IHS's positioning between the urban and the international, I would say, is mediated by a very strong sense of what we call southern urbanism. So we are very much understand ourselves as an institution in the global south, and we find that our relationships to the international are mediated by this positioning. So we have a very strong set of global partnerships. We I just began with the curriculum development process, partnering with MIT in Boston and University College of London, 
as well as the University of Sao Paulo and the, Af and the African sector of the cities and the University of Cape Town. And those set of partnerships have always grounded us. So we have ongoing research um, with, over, I would say, I think over 30 of the world's leading universities in different places. Um, and through Urban Lens and Urban Arc and, and all of these things, you'll see all of them pass through um, the campus when you're here. Um, I think that notionally, in many ways, this is a tricky conceptual space because it's very easy to enter into a world of global partnerships and sort of play the game of international development. But we do it with a very specific conceptual anchoring in the history of the global south. So we are interested in what Indian cities have to learn from Lagos and Cairo and Manila and Dhaka and, and Johannesburg as much and much more than we are in following the classic tropes of New York, London, Paris, Tokyo and Singapore. We don't think the second are irrelevant, don't get me wrong. My idea is not to sort of create boundaries from places where we can learn, places where we can't. But I think that we have to understand the history of power relations within which knowledge has flown from the models of New York and London and the newer models of Singapore and Shanghai and not accept them uncritically. So our, our location to these questions is very much to say that we believe that a southern knowledge epistemological paradigm is required. We need knowledge that comes from here and informs all urban theory for cities in the world. We need to recognize that the history of the way urban knowledge has come has come from particular places. And we are very conscious of that location, while also being conscious that we don't want to become defensive and parochial and insular and inward looking in a way that basically says no one else can understand what India is. You know, that exceptionalism that has done us a lot of harm in the past. So our notion of the global is tethered through this deviation to the South. Um, and I think that's where we would come through. In India, particularly, the question of the urban and its contradistinction to the rural is one of the central premises of what we do. Right? Um, we are very much a country that was imagined rural. Um, we are very much a country where the urban has only recently become a matter of policy and practice and debate. Um, and we are also in an Anthropocene where questions of the climate and resources mean that urban rural distinctions are also not as useful or as clear or as self evident as they used. So the urban for us is both a site of an argument as well as a question. Um, and I think we pack it and unpack it in different ways. We're never too wedded to it, we never take it too seriously. But we also take it seriously enough in a country where the urban transition is very real and the rural and the urban are distinct in many other ways. So we hold both of these often contradictory trends of thought together. That there is a very real difference between the urban and the rural in India, and there is not a very real difference between the urban and rural India. And the complexity of the 21st century actually means both of those are true. Um, and that's part of that positioning that defines where we are. Yeah. Trevor, my specific question from Rishika, which is, um, do fellows have the option of interning at a firm which deals with real estate, uh, economics, and finance? And the answer is absolutely. We've had fellows in the last two years specifically intern at uh, a real estate consulting firm called CVRE, for example. Um, and like I mentioned with, I think, Divya's question that if a fellow comes in with a good justification and, a, and an interest in interning at a specific place, um, just and the program would work very actively with them to make that happen if it fit their profile and fit the work um, at the fellowship. Yeah, actually, and I think I think the principle that we constantly articulate is that we have no preset notions of quote unquote correct or good or ideologically aligned places for folks to intern. Uh, work is and experience is valuable, and the question is the right fit for the intern. So any place that's there, there's a very wide variety of places already engaged. Um, and therefore, and anything that's not there, we act. Uh, he has a question, which is considering that we, uh, that is India, are as a whole in the transition period of organization, what would you say are the biggest areas of opportunity for an urban fellow? So I would say that we we don't think actually the entire point of our um, IHS's approach to pedagogy is to not think of people who graduate from here as urban planners. We think of them as urban practitioners. And that distinction is very key to us. Because once you think of urban practice as distinct from only the spatial sciences of planning, architecture, and design, 
it actually opens up a whole number of routes to shape urban futures, um, some of which may include planning, but many of them don't. Right? So the question that we think about is, if cities are being shaped by everyone from the person who does municipal finance to the graffiti artist to the infrastructural engineer, as well as the urban designer and the planner and the architect who build the buildings, but also the people who build their own homes for sporting and occupation, then all of these are forms of urban practice. Right? And some of them are professionalized in ways that are called planning. But many of the impact on the actual built form doesn't happen through these firms, the formal interventions that call themselves planning. So for us, the question really would be, if you ask me this question as a fellow, I would actually ask you to step back and say, forget the word planning for a second. What are the kinds of interventions and actions you want to be able to take in cities? What outcomes do you want? What do you want to be able to influence? And then the question is, there are multiple ways in order to be able to influence different setups and systems to those outcomes, right? So if you want, for example, to get to universal access to sanitation, one way to do it is to be in the municipality. The other way to do it is to work with communities to build sanitation directly there. The third way to do it is to advocate for norms and standards. The fourth way to do it is to do research that shows that investment in sanitation causes gains in GDP and make an economic case for it that shapes the policy for it. And those are four completely different modes of practice. One is mobilization, one is direct building, one is government and public systems, one is research and academic research, and the last is policy advocacy. But every one of them leads to the outcome of improved access to sanitation. So for us, I would say, which of these modes are you best equipped to do and want to do? And where then are the institutional locations that allow you to do that practice? So that's more the way we think here, is to think of the outcomes you want and to think of practices in multiple locations from which they can happen and not have a one-to-one -one assumption between aid training, aid practice, and aid in training, a practice, and an institute. Um, there's another more specific question, and uh, two specific questions, again from Rahul. Does IHS provide relevant courses on city-to-city -city partnerships and other development agreements in the context of smart and sustainable cities? For example, the delhi Seoul partnership, or have any previous fellows been involved internships in this field and then we have another question on what's the minimum stipend we receive during the internship and placements from Rishika. Yeah. Um, so I would say I could take one or two and just and chime in what I, what I missed. So I would say that I so that one of the IHS is very involved in a set of global negotiations of two kinds which is the core part of our work so that's where they're most shaping. One is that we were centrally involved in the shaping of SDG 11 on city, and, and the SDSN network is partly anchored at IHS. And our director, Aroma Reddy, is one of the people very keenly involved in the UCLG local government networks and negotiating the city's goals. So in terms of international frameworks, the thing that is very dominant at IHS is the SDG. So we have an entire lab that works on localization. We're one of the centers that tracks the SDG localization, we have data dashboards that work on them, and we work closely with international partners and agreements on the SDG. The second is that we are also closely involved in the IPCC process. So that's our second set of global diplomatic relationships in different ways. And between the uh, United Council of Local Governments, uh, C40, the IPCC, and the SDG, you have a lot of spaces to involve yourself in international agreements and negotiations in different ways. Um, and we, those elements come into our teaching. For example, our director, Aro Reddy, who's part of central to many of these processes, teaches master classes on international diplomatic negotiation around urban agreements. Um, and it shows up in different scales in our governance class or in, uh, you know, in looking at the course on sustainable cities or the course on climate change with scale back and forth between the international agreements. And all. So there are many ways in which you can engage with them. So there is the practice of them that we are involved with, and then there is um, and I think this question was on the stipend. We don't work with a minimum one, um, but we typically, and so the decision is taken actually, it depends a bit on the spread of uh, how many fellows are getting paid and how many fellows are not. And then it determines how much we can maximize. But uh, I will say that every year it ends up to be something that will quite reasonably support you for a couple of months um, in a slightly, let's say, rough sheet student life. Like you won't be, you won't, you won't be 
you won't be uh, loaded in the money, but you also won't be broke. It's still a couple of months, not a bad thing. Um, okay. We have another question, which is on how open are organizations to consider candidates from different backgrounds for internships? Again, um, I'm, I think how it works with placements and internships is that we would find a project in an organization that would require your skill set. So you could want to, you could have an interest in working on, say, smart cities, but maybe not have the finance background that you might assume you need to work on something like that. And, and you would work with the placements team here and your mentor to find the right kind of organization that would, um, that would suit your background. Do you want to add anything to that? I'd only say that, you know, the, one of the things that is, one is that you're not, you're applying to the internship with the skills that you came in with and your training, but also the skills you pick up at IHS. So actually that gap narrows quite significantly. You remember that you're going to be applying, having learned and picked up lots of things with us. So a lot of our fellows actually end up considering themselves qualified for positions they would not consider themselves qualified for when they entered the fellowship because of what they've learned. And that's one of the key things you'll see changing in yourself is that you're going to realize that you've actually picked up a whole set of perspectives and tools that your training didn't give you. But I'll also say that remember these are internships, you're not applying to school, you're applying to places that have relationships with us. So they know our fellows. They've now taken 150 of them over years. They know the and they are precisely attracted to their interdisciplinarity. And so that's one of the things that we've noticed in the last couple of years is that most of the organizations who take our fellows want them precisely because of the mix of trainings that come for. Um, if internships require specific skills, then in the description of the internship in the interview, they ask. And so it may be, like in the real world, there's a couple of things you won't be able to apply for because you require specialized GIS knowledge or specialized R knowledge. But typically, these organizations, because they're involved with us, to do this internally, don't assess your CV as an external internship candidate. They basically look at the CV and say, what's a good fit for this person, as opposed to, I need to do X, what can they do? So a lot of these are not offered internships. They're created as projects for you guys. I just want, I want you to keep that in mind. That takes a bit of a skill matching problem. All right, shall we take a last question? Should we have it for about a block? Or are we good? Uh, we don't have a last question right now. Uh, if anyone wants to write something in, please do so now. Otherwise, we can take last words of advice from you and then from me and then return everyone to their happy Mondays. Mm -hmm. Or end of Mondays. Yeah, end of. Uh, my last words of advice are apply on time. Because I'm so true to you. <laughs> I completely agree with you. Um, no matter how much we try, the last day is always insane. And I can I, I don't know how to stress this enough. I'm not saying we're not saying apply like tomorrow, but we're saying don't apply on April 17th. Um, really just do it a couple of days before. Don't risk the systems. There is a crazy flood of hundreds of applications coming in. And uh, you know, it's it's just better to apply on time. And I think I've already said the other bit that my advice to you is is really think and understand about why this is a fit for you and really write an application that conveys quite genuinely about you. Um you we're not the application isn't necessarily the space to show us how sophisticated your conceptual thinking is. So we'll, we'll see that in class. Um but just Take one last look at it. Know that it's a taught course. Know you're going back to the classroom. Know it's a fellowship. Know what it's about. And then tell us why you still want to come and you think it's the right thing for you at this time in your life. So the more you communicate that, the more successful you will be. And I wish you luck. And I uh, I'm, I hope I get to see some of you on the other side at some point. And um, uh, yeah, I think we have some logistical or something that you're looking like she has to information to give you. Yeah, yeah. No, there's just a last question on if uh, this webinar can be viewed again, and it, and you can. It's on the website of the Urban Fellows Program. There's a little tab, uh, drop-down menu for webinars. Just have a look at that. Um, they're also often on our YouTube page. Um, and if you can't find the links, always know you can you can tweet at us or Facebook us, and we can send that link to you directly. But thank you so much for coming to this webinar, and thank you to Gautam also for these questions, and uh, we hope to see you guys soon. See you guys soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.